Hey everybody, today we're reading But Not Buddy by Christopher Paul Curtis, and we're reading chapter five. Chapter five. Being on the lamb was a whole lot of fun for about five minutes. Every time my heart beat, I could feel the blood pulsing hot and hard inside of my string sting spots and the bite on my hand. But I couldn't let that slow me down. I had to get out of this neighborhood as quick as I could. I knew a nervous looking stum stung up kid with blood dripping from a fish head bite and carrying an old raggedy suitcase didn't look like he belonged around here. The only hope I had was the north side of the library. There, maybe Miss Hill would be able to help me. Maybe she'd understand and would able be able to tell me what to do. And for now, I could sneak into the library's basement to sleep. It was a lot later than I'd ever been up before, and I was kind of scared of the cops catching me. I had to be real careful. Even if it was the middle of the night, even if I was crouching down, sneaking along the street like pretty boy Floyd. At the library, I walked past a row of giant Christmas trees that were planted on the side of the building. There was a door on the side with a light burning above it, so I kept walking in the shadows made by the big trees. When I got to the back windows, I almost busted out crying. Somebody had gone and put big metal bars on the windows. Even though I knew it was useless, I tried tugging at the bars, but they were the real McCoy, solid steel. I headed back to the Christmas trees. They were low enough to the ground that no one could see me unless they were really looking, so I started opening my suitcase. Most folks don't have sense enough to carry a blanket around with them, but you never know when you might be sleeping under a Christmas tree at the library, so I always keep mine handy. I untied the strange knots that the Amoses had put in my twine and opened the suitcase. I could tell right away that someone had been fumbling through my things. First, first off, whenever I put the blanket in, I always fold it so that it stops all the other things from banging up against each other but those doggone Amoses had just stuffed it in without paying no mind to what it was mashing up against. I lifted the blanket out and saw that everything else was still there. You might be able to say that the Amoses were some real mean old nosy folks, but you couldn't call them thieves. I picked up the old tobacco bag that I keep my rocks in. I could tell by the way the drawstring was pulled that the Amoses had been poking through this too. I jiggled it up and down in my hand a couple of times, and it felt like none of the rocks was missing, but I opened it to count them anyway. None of them was gone. Next, I pulled Mama's picture out of the envelope I kept it in and held it so the light from the library's side door would shine down on it. It looked like the Amoses hadn't heard it. This was the only picture of Mama in the world. Running across the top of it was a sign that was writ on, with, writ on a long skinny flag. It said, boys and girls, follow the gentle light to the misbegotten moon park. Underneath the sign between two big wagon wheels was Mama. She was about as old as I am now and was looking down and frowning. I can't understand why she was so unhappy. This park looked like the kind of place you could have a lot of fun. In the picture, Mama was sitting on a real live little midget horse. It looked tired and dragged out like those big work horses do, but it had a teeny tiny body with a big sag where most horses have a straight back. Mama was sitting right in the middle of the horse's back, riding him side saddle, except there wasn't any saddle, so I guess you have to say she was riding him side sag. She had two six-shooter pistols in her hands, and the way her face looked, you could tell she wished she could have emptied them on somebody. And I know who that somebody was. Mama told me it was her father, my granddad. He'd gone and ruined everybody's fun that day by getting in a big fight with my mother about the gigantic white 25 gallon Texas cowboy hat that she was wearing. Mama used to tell me that hard headed man insisted, insisted, mind you, that I wear that horrible hat. The hat was almost as big as Mama, and you could see it was fake because as tall as it was, no real cowboy could have wore it without getting it knocked off his head every time he rode under a tree or some telegraph wires. Mama told me that some 
man used to drag the midget horse all through her neighborhood with a camera, and if your mama or daddy signed a piece of paper, he'd take some pictures of you, then come back in a couple weeks so you could buy them. Mama wasn't looking like she had rocks in her jaw because the hat was so fake that a real cowboy would have laughed you out of town for wearing it. She was mad because the hat was so dirty. When she used to tell me about it, her eyes would get big and burny like the whole thing happened the day before yesterday instead of all those years ago. She'd start moving around our apartment real quick, picking things up and putting them back in the exact same spot. Filth, she'd say about the hat. Absolute filth. Why, the thing was positively alive with germs. Who knows what type of people had worn it? I'd say, I don't know, Mama. She'd say, who knows how many years it has been worn by who knows how many sweaty little heads. I'd say, I don't know, Ma. She'd say, the entire band on the inside was black, and I'm sure it was crawling with ringworm, lice, and tetters. I'd say, yes, Mama. She'd say, and that horrid little photographer didn't care. Do you imagine it ever occurred to him to wash it? I'd say, no, Mama. She'd say, of course not. We meant less to him than that horse he mistreated so. I'd say, yes, Mama. She'd say, but your grandfather insisted. To this day, I cannot understand why, but he insisted, insisted. I'd say, yes, Mama. We had that conversation a lot of times. Me and Mama having the same conversations lots of times is one of the main things I can remember about her now. Maybe that's because when she'd tell me these things, she used to squeeze my arms and look right hard in my face to make sure I was listening. But maybe I remember them because those arm-squeezing, face-looking times were the only times that things slowed down a little bit when Mama was around. Everything moved very, very fast when Mama was near. She was like a tornado, never resting, always looking around us, never standing still. The only time stuff didn't blow around when she was near was when she'd squeeze my arms and tell me things over and over and over and over. She had four favorite things to tell me. One of them was about the picture, and another one was about my name. She'd say, Bud, your name is your name, and don't you ever let anyone call you anything outside of that either. She'd tell me, especially, don't you ever let anyone call you Buddy. I may have some some problems, but being stupid isn't one of them. I wouldn't have added that D-Y onto the end of your name if I intended it for it to be there. I knew what I was doing, buddy. <clears throat> Excuse me. I knew what I was doing. Buddy is a dog's name or a name that someone's going to use on you if they're being false friendly. Your name is Bud, period. I'd say, okay, mama. And she'd say every single time, and do you know what a bud is? I always answered, yes, mama. But it was like she didn't hear me. She'd tell me anyway. A bud is a flower to be. A flower in waiting, waiting for just the right warmth and care to open up. It's the a little fist of love waiting to unfold and be seen by the world. And that's you. I'd say, yes, mama. I know she didn't mean anything by naming me after a flower but it's sure not something I'd tell anybody about. Another thing she'd tell me was, don't you worry, bud. As soon as you get to be a young man, I have a lot of things I'll explain to you. That didn't make me calm at all. That was Bud Codwell's rules and things to have a funner life and make a better life of yourself, number 83. Rules and things, number 83. If an adult tells you not to worry and you weren't worried before, you better hurry up and start because you're already running late. She'd tell me, these things I'm going to explain to you later will be a great help for you. Then Mama would look hard in my face, grab hold of my arms real tight and say, and Bud, I want you always to remember, no matter how bad things look to you, no matter how dark the night, when one door closes, don't worry, because another door opens. I'd say, what, it opens all by itself? She'd say, yes, it seems so. That was it. Another door opens. That was the thing that was supposed to have helped me. I should have known then that
that I was in for a lot of trouble. It's funny how now that I'm 10 years old and just about a man, I can see how Mama was so wrong. She was wrong because she probably should have told me the things she thought I was too young to hear because now that she's gone, I'll never know what they were. Even if I was too young back then, I could have rememorized them and used them when I did need help, like right now. She was also wrong when she thought I'd understand that nonsense about doors closing and opening all by themselves. Back then it really scared me because I couldn't see what one door closing had to do with another one opening unless there was a ghost involved. All her talk made me start jamming a chair up against my closet door at night. But now that I'm almost grown, I see Mama wasn't talking about doors opening to let ghosts into your bedroom. She meant doors like the door at the home closing and leading to the door at the Amos's opening and the door in the shed opening and letting me, leading me to sleeping under a tree, getting ready to open the next door. I checked out the other things in my suitcase and they seemed okay. I felt a lot better. Right now I was too tired to think anymore so I closed my suitcase, put the proper knots back in the twine, crawled under the Christmas tree, and wrapped myself in the blanket. I'd have to wake up real early if I wanted to get to the mission in time for breakfast. If you were one minute late, they wouldn't let you in for food.